okay okay so if, it, if this succeeds we'll have something up there on YouTube without me having to do anything afterwards but if it doesn't I've still got the recording so that's <coughs> the that's the plan so let's go back to here and um, yes yeah, so we, I forgot what I was just saying yes we, we'll take our time to look in a little bit more detail so just to kind of um, give the overview then to the Sermon on the Mount well, one of the things people are very often aware of is is that Luke seems to cover similar material but the, the positioning and and the and the content don't quite match with Matthew it's just one of those um, those little things and, and it's worth just addressing it's the kind of thing we've touched on several times when we've been um, looking at, at some of the material we have or how you harmonize the Gospels um, and, um, and a lot of it comes down, if you stop and think about it, to the style and structure that both Matthew and Luke have used. And for the people they're writing for, that's shaped for, and so on and so forth. So um, uh, in, uh, in Matthew's Gospel, the way he's kind of put things together, um, one of the things we don't sometimes realise is he's, he's writing in a very Aramaic way. We're told by the <coughs> early church that, that Matthew's written his Gospel and he wrote it in Hebrew. And the, the kind of the inference, although we're not told explicitly, is that actually his gospel is put together while the disciples are all there together in Jerusalem. And it's what's referred to in the Acts as, as adhering to the apostles' teaching, is that they are structuring together as a team, if you like, the, the authorised version of Jesus' ministry. And Matthew is working in that context as the kind of the main scribe. Um, he's probably been the note taker because that's part of his training as an accountant and so on. And, um, and he, he writes of all of the Gospels. His is, is so rich with he Hebraisms or Aramaisms. Um, it, it comes across very, very kind of distinctly in Matthew. Um, some would sometimes say that of Mark, but actually there, there, are, there, there are more in Matthew than in, in Mark. Um, um, and within that context, he does a very kind of Hebrew thing, which is Matthew 4, which is kind of the kicking off of Jesus's ministry. If I kind of put it up in my Bible. So, um, you know, we, is where we, we remember kind of how how um, Jesus's ministry starts off with the calling of the, the, the fishermen and so on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, you go at the end of Matthew 4 so from that time Jesus began to preach and say repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand and we tend to read right the way through from that, that verse which is verse uh, 18 no verse 17 in chapter 4 we read from there to the end of chapter 4 as if they're the first early events but it's not and what what Matthew's actually done is he's given you a summary statement of everything he's about to tell us um, it, it's um if you, if you think about just what it was like for for an author in the ancient world, um, written materials are expensive. Um, you need to kind of get almost everything right on your first draft um, because you're not going to play around with it multiple times. Um, it's likely that the gospel was put together in, in kind of chunks that were circulated. But in his different chunks, you kind of um, therefore you will sometimes be covering same material as you've already covered in another, but just in in Precy. And this is kind of a bit like one of those chunks. So the end of Matthew 4, he's giving us this kind of summary statement of Jesus's first tour. So from that time, Jesus starts to preach and teach and say, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He kind of right the way down to finish in verse 25. And great multitudes followed him from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. Well, all that happens in just eight verses because it's not really detail. It's just a summary. Um, and it, it's but in that context, it, we then have right at the beginning. So he, Matthew said, we're going to tell you about Jesus's first tour. Here's what the summary of it is. And then he starts off with and when he saw the multitudes, he went up the mountain and sat down and his disciples came to him. <coughs> so we've got that kind of summary section. So then Matthew five, which is verse one, right the way through to um, chapter eight, verse one is really what we call the Sermon on the Mount which is now a summary of all of the teaching that Jesus was doing with his disciples on that tour. Um, so, but it's presented probably as part of the flow of the events. Um, so there probably is a, a mount, mountain where Jesus goes up and the disciples come to him. But he kind of presents everything together. And it, it's interesting because although it says he's gone up the mountain, he's on his own um, and his disciples come to him. By the end, it talks about there being multitudes there. <laughs> Um, and so in one sense, um, the Sermon on the Mount is a literary device of Matthew's, um, which is not him faking it. It's actually a much more easy way to kind of get your head around what Jesus was doing. If, if, if he said over the next year while we were going around, Jesus taught lots of bits and he broke it up into lots of bits, it wouldn't have the impact. Um, and it's sometimes been said that Matthew's gospel, it looks like it was being written for discipleship. 
um, which makes sense of the early church in those kind of contexts where it's trying to discipleship disciple people. So Matthew's kind of collected it all together like that. Um, and then we after Matthew um, 8, as we get on into now to Matthew 8, 2 verses to 9, 38, we get lots of examples of miracles and events from the tour. We read about things like the leper, centurion servant, there's a gap, and then there's Peter's mother-in-law is in there getting healed. Then there's a load more miracles, and then we get Matthew being called which is the other calling passage in the Gospels, if we stop and think about it. In the Synoptic Gospels, we know about the call of Matthew, and we know about the call of the um, disciples, sorry, of the fishermen, uh, but we don't know the others. So Matthew is now called. And then when we get to Matthew 10, because that's Matthew 9, Matthew is called, um, Jesus then commissions the 12, and he sends them out, and he start, he's now teaching them on missions. Now, if you compare that with Luke's Gospel, and Luke really is covering the same event, but from a different sort of perspective. He's, it, there's not a contradiction, although they read very differently. So, so Luke, um, in Luke's Gospel, um, uh, he, oh, I've got the integration there. I think I've got, yeah, here we go. In Luke 4, we, we get kind of much more detail about Jesus moving from Nazareth to Capernaum. We don't read that in the other Gospels. We just hear Jesus moved to Capernaum. <laughs> Um, we hear why Jesus had to leave Nazareth because they tried to throw him off the cliff. And we read about him coming down the, the cliffside and looking over the lake and seeing the, the, the fishermen while they're fishing and so on and so forth. Um, and so we've got a kind of a whole load of detail about Jesus arriving in Capernaum. Um, and then um, th there's, a, there's a kind of a remarkable day, which we read about in Luke, which in, in reading Matthew's account, we wouldn't know it was all on one day because it's just spread out. It, they're just events from the time he's talked about, which starts with healing in the synagogue, but because it's a Sabbath, everybody stays quiet. They go back to Peter's house. His mother-in-law is unwell. Jesus heals her. Then the sunset comes. Now it's no longer Sabbath, so everybody turns up. <laughs> so we often miss, there is a, there's a kind of cultural reasons why they all turn up in the evening, which is he, he was in trouble for healing in, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So everybody now wants to get healed, but they don't want to get into trouble. So they they wait for the end of the evening and he brings and in Matthew's gospel we read about his how he's praying and ministering for people through the night. And then both Matthew's gospel and in Luke that it refers um we have that kind of that kind of event. But in Luke's gospel, we just told Jesus retire, retires to a lonely place. Um and that, that probably is Luke's reference to the same point that Matthew said Jesus went up a hill and his disciples or went up the mountain and his disciples came to him. And it's probably in that context that Jesus first starts to unwind, if you like, the ethical teaching that is going to be the heart of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. So in Matthew's gospel, he's used that first occasion as his anchor point, and he's put all of the teaching into that, if you like, um, as, a, as a single sermon. Whereas when we're reading Luke's account, we re hear about him going to a lonely place and then eventually the multitudes finding him and him then going off on the tour. Um, so then Luke 5 to 6 tells about Jesus' tour of Galilee. And so we've got and he actually then starts that now with the call of um, Peter, James and John, which has probably already happened. But because of the way, as I say, you would write in a chunk, get it finished. Then you say, now the next thing we're going to talk about, because in one sense, this was a chunk about how Jesus moved to Capernaum. Now I'm going to talk about the tour and better start with the call, even though there was a bit of an overlap. You see, so so he tells the story of the call, and then um and then we kind of and goes on and we have very similar events to what we find in Matthew's gospel, and then we read about the call of Matthew, and then after the call of Matthew, um Luke then concludes the tour with his version on the Sermon on the Mount, which is the point where in Matthew Jesus is preaching the sermon to send out the twelve, um and in Luke he blends the two together. The two are squeezed together. And so it, it probably in reality, there would be a kind of a sense, not just a sense. In, in reality, Jesus has been teaching stuff all the way through. And at the, the final moment is a kind of a recap of everything we've done. Plus, now you're going out. <laughs> so Matthew's given that as the sermon on how to be commissioned. Um, and it's, it, Luke's rolled them all together. And he's kind of shown some of the teaching that's in the Sermon on the Mount. But the, the, you can see it's just real life. And being recorded from two different perspectives, slightly different agendas. Um, uh, Luke, Luke is is much more kind of interested in the kind of the the flow of event after event, whereas Matthew is much more kind of Hebrew in the way of thinking, which is thematically kind of bundling things together. Um, but then it's not that's not an ex, ex, it's not that Matthew is never one and Luke is never the other. It's just 
it's, it's kind of that priority of, of storytelling. So the, the two do fit together, but we're going to use Matthew's gospel because it's the full version. It's kind of it, it brings Jesus's, if you like, ethical manifesto is the way I can put it together. It's what does it mean? What is it, what's at the heart of for, the, for those disciples that want to follow Jesus up the mountain um, to find out what he's really about? Um, what is the what's the agenda? Um, and what's kind of going on? So, um, yeah, as I say, integrating the two this is just what we've been covered. So Luke has Jesus withdrawing to a more private place. Matthew places. So we've done, we've looked at that. So I'll just skip through. So let's think about the sermon, the way that Matthew structured it, because Matthew is is incredibly well structured gospel. It's one of those things that when you see how how carefully he's put things together and packaged things together, you kind of realise an awful lot of thought and meditation. That's why I say it probably is the official gospel, if you like, of the um, of, of the twelve working together, kind of um, getting these things um, sorted. And you, you find that in the um, in the Sermon on the Mount. There's a kind of an instant sense of parallel, obviously, with the with with the Ten Commandments. Um, so obviously Moses goes up a mountain <laughs> and then he comes down with the Ten Commandments. Um, and actually, there's a kind of a structure, if you think about the Ten Commandments, because this, this is clearly Jesus is kind of being presented right at the start of his ministry in a kind of a sort of very mosaic sort of way. Um, with his uh, with these rules for living, but if you th they they kind of fit beautifully, they complement and integrate with the Ten Commandments really really nicely. Um, so if you think about the Ten Commandments um, in the way we tend to think about them, because as I only discovered actually in doing the detail here, I hadn't realised quite how controversial the Ten Commandments are, <laughs> and I don't mean modern controversy. I mean going right the way back to before Jesus. The so arguments with the so we call them the Ten Commandments, but the Bible never calls it the Ten Commandments. It has 17 verses where God speaks um, and various rabbis broke it up into 10 statements, but they didn't always break it up in the same place. <laughs> so what we think of as the Ten Commandments has not always been the Ten Commandments. Sometimes they were slightly different places, same text, but organized slightly differently so that you get 10, 10 rules. <laughs> But, but if we kind of take the standard version, which you get in, in the, the kind of is structured that way by the, the writers of the Septuagint, you've got have no gods before Yahweh um, is, is rule number one. Don't make idols. Don't use Yahweh's name emptily or in vain and honour the Sabbath. Um, and so there's a kind of a sense about having the right attitude for how you're dealing with the Lord. It's If you think if you sum up what's what's this first intro section it's kind of get your heart in the right place, honour him, don't put other things before him, make space for his Sabbath, I to rest in him, don't take his name emptily, take it seriously, get your heart into this sort of a process. And then the fifth command kind of shifts the focus to honouring those that paved the way for us. So honour your father and mother. It's In other words, actually, remember you're always building on somebody else's platform. And actually, in, if um, what I want is to look at the commandments, because the English word is commandments, the, the Jews never called them that. They called them the sayings, the ten sayings or the ten words. They were a kind of summary of the law. Um, and actually, they are. I, I think their their impact is is much more the process it has in us than than it is something that we are desperately trying to keep. If I can put it that way, is that when we when we kind of honour them, we obviously there's a place in which by honouring them we try and keep them. But but it's not quite the same as a standard that if you fail against, because God is already acting in grace. He's already reaching out. He's kind of saying this is the way you should be. And and to think of the commandments as the sayings or the words is far more positive because when God's word goes out, it produces fruit. So if I receive it, it's his word to me. You know, you shall not lie. <laughs> That's so much different from you shall not lie. So one is a command. The other is a is God's word to me. Does that make sense? In other words, it's. It's God's intention into me that I won't be a liar, and he's spoken it creatively into me. Therefore, it's really important that, that the first part is working properly, which is I'm, I'm open to his, his grace, his, um, which is the Sabbath, um, his activity. I'm learning from those who have gone before me. And there's a, a kind of a whole sense in which the first half of what we think of as the Ten Commandments, the Ten Sayings, is, is about putting our heart in the right way to receive what it is that God is, is breathing into us, what he's speaking into us. Um, and then we kind of come on to command six to nine, and then all about how we treat our peers. So it's kind of receiving down and then out to, to others. So obviously don't murder, which um, in the Sermon on the Mount we're going to see is reflected because we, we'll find these four th themes that are about peers, we do find very quickly reflected in the text of the Sermon on the Mount. 
So you know, don't murder. Jesus says you've heard said don't 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 murder, but don't be angry. <laughs> Um, don't commit adultery you've heard that said but what's your lust you know don't don't look on people for the sake of uh, of of um of feeding your, your sexual brokenness um don't steal and jesus talks about settling debts quickly you see well they're, they're just they're, one's an extreme action but the other is the heart attitude you know <laughs> um you know i'm i'm not likely to steal but you know uh, on those times when money is tight it, it's enough tempting not to pay back what you actually owe <laughs> you, you know how you, you know that kind of that that different thing one is one kind of goes so far but actually this kind of goes in a bit further don't bear false witness you know jesus talks about that your yes be yes your no be no it's about there's a kind of about integrity whereas the the, the, the commandments are more pragmatic they're about putting a boundary on bad behavior but they're not getting at the root and then it kind of concludes with the 10th command, um, which requires a kind of much more private approach to holiness, because covetousness is, is don't, don't be envious. That's an internal thing. That's the, first, the only point in the Ten Commandments where, so we've gone from, if you like, the, the, the place of grace and standing under it and receiving from the Lord. Here's the expectations and the fruit, um, but they are more like limits. They're about limiting the dysfunction in me, you know. Um, I may not like you, and we may argue all the time, but as long as I don't kill you, that's better. <laughs> so don't murder. You see, you know, it's it's putting a boundary. It's not dealing with the problem. It's just mm -hmm. putting a boundary on it. When we get to the final command, it's first the the only point in the Ten Commandments which turns it in and says, now let's see if we can work on something on the inside. Uh, whereas in many ways, we think about the Sermon on the Mount. It starts at that point. It starts on how do we internalize this. How do we actually take what's just limiting and controlling and actually getting to the root of the problem, which is the motive rather than the action, the, the commands or the words, and measuring actions. Now, you'll notice on there, I've got a couple of things grouped with one, two, threes, you see. So um, on Yahweh, your God. Um, and those, those, um, th those one, two, threes, this is where I was saying different rabbis and um, different even Christian traditions. So the, the, the Catholic tradition is different from the Protestant one. Um, Ethiopian was slightly differently is that what they would do is some of them would treat you see these up to one one two or even all three of those first commands as being one command you see which is kind of honoring the Lord your God so you say you know it says honor the Lord your God with all your heart soul and mind this is just ex one command it's just stretched it out to three points if that makes sense so you could wind that one up into three and similarly at the other end um, the um the actual command about covetousness lists various things it says your house your your neighbor's house his wife um and, and his property basically slaves and his animals you see so so you could break that one into three um so with that mix you can get all of these different rabbinic traditions and even christian traditions on exactly how you break the ten commandments up which kind of if if you do roll the, the three up i just think it's kind of interesting to note if you if you roll the if you if you keep the tenth commandment is just one commandment, not three, and you do roll the first command, three commandments up into just one, then obviously you have eight, <laughs> which interestingly is just one of those things to observe is how many beatitudes Jesus kicks off. Um, he he kicks off with eight words of, of blessing, and if the words are these kind of words of instruction or words of life breathed into us, if you like, there is a kind of a at a certain logical level, although it's very hard for us with 2000 years of tradition calling the Ten Commandments the Ten Commandments to hear it as eight actual instructions. <laughs> but actually, different people have actually recognized that some of it is just a long version of one basic idea, if I can put it that way. So so there is a, that, that's something I only really have thought about more recently. It's not something I've touched on before, but I just I, I find it kind of fascinating um, just what was going on in Jesus's mind. <laughs> And as they've recorded and summarized the teaching with these eight kind of statements, which in a certain way kind of parallel the eight statements that lie at the heart of what we break into Ten Commandments. Um, so when the book comes out, I'll definitely highlight that and draw that out in a nice, clear way <laughs> for people to see. Um, <clears throat> what does it say? Drawn for his eight beatitudes. I think I mistyped something. I was doing the slides earlier today. Um, yeah, it should say um, it should say the Sermon on the Mount has eight beatitudes, but uh, <laughs> matching the minimum list of commands drawn from the prologue of the law. Um, and and um, and that, that's actually I call it here the prologue to the law because in actual fact, if you go back and you look in Exodus and um, and in Deuteronomy, 
I think it's particularly true in Exodus. Um, in, a, in a part of Exodus, which I haven't really covered in the book that I've just done on, on, the, on Jesus appearing in Exodus. But um, after the, uh, as the law is then given by Moses, um, basically everything that kind of flows on out of it is attached to, to one of those commands. Um, so um, if I kind of just quickly run back. So chapter 20, we start with the Ten Commandments, which are kind of like the prologue. Um, and then as we kind of move on past that, and there's a little bit of description about how it all happens, and we start getting into the kind of the detail, um, we kind of start finding, so, you know, this is now chapter 21. He who strikes a man so that he dies surely has to be put to death. But if he didn't lie in wait for him, but God let him fall into his hands, I will appoint you a place from which you can flee. But if a man acts presumptuously towards a neighbour so as to kill him craftily, you have to make him even from my altar, even if he goes and hangs on to the altar, he should die. See, that's expounding, don't commit murder. Does that make sense? And then it goes on from there. And if you strike your father or mother, then you also you'll be put to death. You may not kill them. But that's actually honouring your parents, you see. So what actually happens is everything that comes after is a, is a kind of an exposition of what some put in the summary, the prologue. And, and we find the same pattern with Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. He gives his eight statements. <laughs> Um, this is this is how the sermon is going to uh, unwind. This is how it's going to develop, um, and uh, and then he then everything that comes in the Sermon on the Mount until you get to the kind of summary at the end um, basically fits with one of those eight statements. Um, it's a kind of an exposition, which gives us a, an ability to kind of um, actually explore them one at a time, which we'll do a little bit tonight, looking at the the first or the last one, depending on which way we want to look at it, as we'll see. So, so Jesus, as he gives the Sermon on the Mount, is he's assuming the kind of, if you like, the same attitudes that are expressed in those first five commandments, i.e. that you have to be in that place of openness and responsibility and you're going to receive from others and those that understand more than you, so on and so forth. And then he, then he kind of picks up, um, very specifically, he speaks to the four subjects, you know, murder, stroke, anger, um, adultery, stroke, um, lust, um, or um, you know, impurity of thought. Um, uh, stealing versus the the you other know, um, agreedness with money, you know, and slowness to pay debts, etc., etc., um, and um, and lying and our basic integrity. He he touches all those, but he then does them in the kind of the manner of that last statement, which is the internalizing flow. So he kind of picks up and reflects back what were the limits that the law put in place for people. But he now kind of goes right for the heart as to how does that actually work itself out in you. <clears throat> so he's got his eight statements. And blessed are the poor in spirit, for those of the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are those who mourn, because they'll be comforted. Blessed are the meek, because they'll inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, because they'll be filled. Blessed are the merciful, because they will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, because they'll be called the sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then, and you, you notice over here, I put the kind of the verses um, as you run through the Sermon on the Mount that, that actually become the exposition. So you have those notes next week. Um, but actually, um, to kind of give you kind of a quick snapshot, you can kind of feel it because you'll note these are all famous quotes. And you'll see that they follow the same order. But what you'll notice if you go back, sorry, if I go back, is that the the the, the Beatitudes run in one order. So the first one is the poor in spirit. But if you look at the Matthew reference on the other side, you'll notice that they, they're expounded in reverse order. So it's kind of like Jesus goes, I'm going to give you the summary, summary one, two, three. Now I'll give you the exposition, three, two, one. So he kind of works back in reverse order the way he's outlaid it at the beginning. So, which is why I'm saying, depending on which way round you want to look at it, you can think of the first or the last that we'll look at tonight. <laughs> but so, um, so Jesus says, first, first beatitude is blessed to the poor in spirit. Towards the end of Matthew, we're reading into by the narrow gate. I.e., there's something about that the the attitude we have to following him that requires going low, and it's not all, not the easy way, etc. Um, he talks about blessed are those who mourn, um, which as you read through the Old Testament, you'll find that the word mourning is used actually very much towards having a serious attitude to our failing. It's, it's, we think of mourning as being when somebody has died. It's actually disappointment in ourselves almost. It's, it's, um, 
it's grieving over you, you you look at some of them um, i watch the news and find myself doing, doing this all the time but that's that's out there but also taking it on personally it's it's much more of that sense of actually this is not the way the world should be this, this is what mourning is about um and in that kind of context you know so you, you understand we find verses like by your standard we measure to you um so it's actually how seriously do i take it in me and that's actually what causes my, my disappointment um, but do I put that and apply that to other, other other people? How do I judge them and so on? Blessed are the meek, and we have don't be anxious because life is more than food and the body more than clothing. The meek are those who are in that place of receiving. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. In the context of, of hungering and thirsting after righteousness, Jesus is going to teach about being aware of being of practicing your righteousness to get op- uh, get noticed because you can be zealous for for righteousness. It's not quite the same. <laughs> In, in that sense of if you, if the zeal, if the zealousness comes out of a real hunger for it, a real desire for it, it's very different from the cute, you can desire the kudos you get by appearing to be right, if I can put it that way. And blessed are the merciful, and he says, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Blessed are the pure in heart, put the, has committed adultery in their heart, if Jesus puts it that way. Blessed are the peacemakers, and Jesus talks about first being reconciled and make friends quickly, through all kind of quotes you find. And um, blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness. I put that little summary quote there, but that's the one that turns straight around. Um, as soon as he says, "Blessed are the um, if you blessed are those who persecute you for righteousness," he then says, "Now blessed are you when you get persecuted for righteousness." So he's starting to expound that, but we'll look at that. Let your light shine, because actually that's that that quote, which is actually from the Psalms, <clears throat> helps us to understand what something of what Jesus is driving at when he's looking for righteousness. So um, there's a kind of a flow as we as we look at the um, at the flow of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and it kind of starts, if you think about it, if you just take, sorry, not the whole Sermon on the Mount, but it, it certainly there's a kind of a flow within the Beatitudes, the summary, um, which once I spotted it, I think I'm sure it's deliberate. <laughs> uh, it's one of those, uh, you know, you, um, is one of those I was just reading it I think one day and I thought oh, that's interesting just the way it kind of develops <laughs> but once once now I've seen it and I've kind of pointed out I, I can't not see it. it's one of those <laughs> those things because there's a kind of a, a very it's a very kind of um it's very descriptive of what I think is the genuine inner journey the inner developmental kind of journey <clears throat> and I realized a little bit that um in the way that the Lord kind of focused my work over the the last how many years <laughs> is that I do t- kind of two things really one is that I, I talk about how the Bible talks about Jesus and the other is I help people on this kind of the developmental kind of journey which is very much an inner sort of yeah it's it's, it's a one of the dynamics of the prophetic it can sometimes have elements of words of wisdom and the prophetic and so on but of the pastoral sorry it's kind of the heart of the pastoral and so I have, I, I think to myself, in many ways, I feel very privileged with the life I've got now, which I get a great opportunity to study the Bible and, these, and find these little bits. And I, I just sometimes go, oh, that's really great. I'm really interested. I'm glad I've seen that. Maybe nobody else is interested, but I'm glad I have. So that's a real privilege. <laughs> and then the other side is I, I get a op- great opportunity and a great excuse to really develop, um, particularly now as I kind of get paid to go in and se- in secular context and, and do things on character. So you have to develop deliver it not in the same way as you would in church and so i get a great opportunity to go and do research on on the best kind of in terms of psychological theory so i i find <laughs> life is great in that sense because i do things i'm enjoying <laughs> um and and actually in the sermon on the mount i find the two start to come together the um uh, and and you can see this in the kind of the flow of the beatitudes so the the first one is so it starts with a kind of a conscious awareness of our poverty of spirit there's something in me that's not not right, <laughs> um, which kind of leads, which is Beatitude one, less to the poor in spirit, which leads to kind of um, that sort of uh, um, sober self awareness, blessed to those who mourn. So I'm actually I'm not happy about that. First of all, I'm not I'm not as nice as I ought to be, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Um, I I um, I I lie far more far more than I would ever want to admit to people and. It's only when you realise how how we so instinctively see the world in ways that justify ourselves that you start to realise how often we can be dishonest without it being a conscious process. If you if you sort of mean you know, <laughs> um, and and part of the thing is because we're very aware 
of of what we intend to do um, and we tend to kind of actually assume that what we intend to do is with the way we were behaving if you know what I mean and it's only when we stop and stand back from it you go do you know what? I probably wasn't being quiet <laughs> in that place I'm laughing and, and I'm I'm confessing to all sorts of terrible things but but this is what part of what I'm saying is is because of this is one of the things now I've spent time doing partly with myself and partly with other people you become very conscious it's very real so you start with a a sense of I do need help and actually I am definitely there's stuff here that I would not be proud of if anybody knew about it and da, 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 but I pretend I don't I pretend it's something different so this is kind of so you end up mourning over it you know <laughs> um and actually then but then you get to a point where you realize but the trouble is this is who I am so that's not a face of complete but there is a kind of an acceptance of so therefore I'm going to need help you know it's um it's not kind of like oh dear I'm not really that I'm so fantastic but I've just failed a bit sometimes it is do you know what this is who I am so I need help <laughs> I need help from you Lord to bring more clarity to myself I need you to give me a bit more security so I don't have to say one thing when I meant another you know all of those kinds of things so so blessed are the meek see those who know that they need help so blessed so blessed are the poor in spirit leads to self-awareness blessed to those who mourn um, become dependent on receiving before we can achieve blessed are the meek which then kind of creates a hunger for god's transformation blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because you know what if i think there is help available then i can be hungry for it <laughs> i can i can actually do i really want to now do it um, you know, I've realised I can't do it myself. I'm, I'm, I'm open to you doing it for me. How much do I hunger for that? How much is that going to? Because that's going to make a difference. And then as we kind of go on, then that hunger and thirst for righteousness actually produces then that um, non-judgmental, non-self-promoting attitude. Um, so I'm just think what I put um, in a life that spreads peace. So, da -da -da -da. oh. Um, must be attitude five. Sorry, that's terrible, isn't it? I've lost. I'm, I'm losing my my line of thoughts as we go. I should know these all instinctively. Um, blessed are the merciful. Sorry, yeah. Okay, so non-judgmental. Blessed are the merciful. Um, and then uh, a simplicity and authenticity of the inner life. Blessed are the pure in heart. Just you know, stop getting too sophisticated. Stop getting too clever. Let's just kind of lead it as simply as possible. Um, which is about being as honest as possible. Um, you know what? I don't know the answer to that. You know what? You're probably right. It was me that was that was late. <laughs> so that's this becomes simple and whatever. It's not sophisticated and complicated. You know, <laughs> when I was seven, my 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 dad looked at me in a strange way, and I've never got over it. That's that's a sophisticated argument. That's an excuse. Simple, <laughs> simple, <coughs> simple excuses. Yeah, I did that. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, and that, that actually helps spread peace. Um, it also gives us, uh, one of the things I, ha I would say definitely is it gives us more confidence in our own selves because we come to terms with ourselves a lot more. Yeah. Um, which actually, if you have that confidence, it allows you to be much more of a peacemaker because you're not, you're, you're very conscious of your own biases and also the, what you're likely to be, tend, how you're likely to be swayed and you're, you can be more deliberate at seeing other people's perspectives and so on. So blessed to the peacemakers. Um, and I put this, um, but as that kind of change does become visible, it does lead to the place where, according to, to the final statement of Jesus, um, blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then he, he turns it around and then says, and so blessed are you when they do, because it is going to happen. And, and that's the one I thought we'd just take, we'd start and kick off with tonight as we as we look at it. Um, is um, is there something about righteousness in in terms of the process and the righteousness that Jesus produces in us that has an ability to create persecution, which isn't strangely seems to be almost in contradiction with something Jesus says a few verses later, where he talks about people seeing our good works and glorifying the Father, but he says that in the context of people persecuting us, um, and there's a kind of a um, and and righteousness is a challenge, you see. Um, it, it, and we have to be kind of aware of it as being a challenge to others, but but that shouldn't stop us trying to pursue it, if I can put it that way. And that it, I, we, we all know and we can all imagine the kind of scenarios where someone will have said to someone in almost in a nasty and unpleasant way, well, it's all right for you because you're so da-da-da. And what they're really saying, all those things they're saying about them are actually good things. 
because actually when things are kind of falling into place in life it does make people cross <laughs> um, not because it's going well for you but because it does highlight that things can go well and they don't have to be stuck in situations they're in and I don't say that in a patronizing sense because people do get caught in terrible deep messes and we have to in all of those sorts of things but there are sometimes there are just inevitable situations where if you like the what God has done in you which is good it provokes a jealousy and provokes a reaction that, that draws persecution but uh, let's unpack then the blessings blessed to those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness because theirs is the kingdom of heaven so because um, <clears throat> later Paul's going to put it this way and, and the reason I, I wanted to pull this out is um, I, I think Romans is written after Matthew's Gospel but most commentators think that Matthew's Gospel was written later and Romans is written first um, so I, it's useful to see that of course it actually this is, this is a, a kind of a well-known verse from Romans it's Paul, one of Paul's major works <laughs> it is his big work for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it's righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So he, he adjoins again, and we find it regularly, the concepts of righteousness and the kingdom of God. And and it's it's useful to kind of tease it out a little bit because we, we they become sort of religious sound bites and we don't stop sometimes and think, what do the two things mean? And how do they fit together? How you know, righteousness is one of those uh those kind of words that, that kind of circles around, you know, back in the the 80s to the 90s you know it was kind of a, a word that, that was used kind of in in a slang type way just to mean a good thing you know <laughs> that's really righteous you know that kind of that phrase it what does it mean there and, and of course it it, it, it if you, you take a kind of technical sense it, it means you're doing it the right way you know it's a it, it's a bit like you, you know if you, if you remember back in the days when we used to have non-digital equipment and used to used to unpack you know like your record player and it, the instructions would say using this incorrectly <laughs> um you know can damage the the function and the thing is it sounds fine if you don't use it correctly you know if you put the, for instance as i as i know if you put the needle in upside down it sounds just as good but it, it does wear out quicker you know <laughs> and wears your records out a bit quicker see it still produces sound that's good enough for my ear <laughs> Um, you know, it's it's kind of so righteousness is not just doing the right thing, but it's doing the right thing in the right way. It's something about actually how it's kind of fitting together, and and um, uh, and the, the kind of the the this kind of the, the concept then of the kingdom of God is really that that um, that sense in which it is very obvious that you are a citizen that who belongs to the jurisdiction of the Lord. That, so there is something about our life that is working correctly, and therefore that in its own way. Oops, this is yeah yeah that in its own way um creates the situation um that um uh, you, sorry it create it creates an, a, a knowledge and experience in us of the fact that the lord is reigning in our lives and, and so on and so forth um but I, one of the things I, I find though which is kind of interesting is is how it kind of fits if you like in in terms of modern psychological thinking that's why i throw it in there um, and I put over here, this is supposed to be Maslow's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I just pulled it off the internet um, <laughs> the other day. Um, and, um, you know, it, it, his, uh, Maslow kind of famously, and it's one of those things that it's easy for people to get their heads around and it's helpful to see. It's one of the, um, you know, which is that obviously we, we all have certain kind of needs. Uh, at the bottom level, we have physiological ones. I, I need to be warm. I need to have food. Um, and so on and then we start to move into slightly more emotional ones and so I need to feel secure and um, probably means there's some good relationships and that that starts then blending so relationships around me I belong to a community that's part of my security and and so but you see you, you know you don't worry about layer three if you haven't got layer one in place so you'd hope that layer three is also part of providing layer one so we kind of gradually building them up then if I'm in a good community, I belong and I begin to find loving relationships, um, then actually in that context, I start to care about what I'm accomplishing. Um, and there's that sense of my esteem or my position within this this social group. And then right at the top, um, which uh, Maslow used to say, very few people actually seem to live this in life, is this kind of top level, which is sort of self-actualizing and achieving one's potential. And and loads of over the years, I've I've regularly used to use this both with young people. I was t doing started in youth work years and years and years ago, <laughs> and I still do it. I, in fact, I said it just last week when I was doing stuff with some students, you know, that I do, which is non-Christian students. 
we kind of introduce this kind of sense of of the hierarchy. I was to say that in at the bottom level, very often, if, you know, as you kind of get near the base of the the pyramid, when we have those needs satisfied, we we call it pleasure. You know, so. Um, so I feel warm. So, you know, it's one of my physiological needs and I've got food in my stomach. <laughs> um, and it, if I eat food and it feels nice, that's a pleasure, a pleasure, you see. <laughs> and as you move then into kind of the more social ones, um, that's where we often talk about and measure things as happiness. Now, it's gotten a little bit more confusing in the last few years because um, when they start, people started doing happiness surveys, it became easier to measure things where people are having pleasure. And so a lot of happiness surveys are much more weighted towards the bottom end. They're just, do you have a pleasurable life, if that makes sense? But they still call it happiness. But I kind of, I, I distinguish happiness to mean what uh, what um, Aristotle called eudaimonic happiness, uh, eudaimonic happiness, which he distinguished from hedonic happiness, which is pleasure. So, <laughs> so go back to the ancient Greeks. He could see there were two different types of happiness. There's pleasure and then there's this sort of one that's more eudaimonic means good for the spirit you good and demonic you know you hear the word <laughs> in, in the greek just simply means spirited good spirited so so you know and so there is a, sometimes a conflict you see because for instance you know um if it's all okay to kind of say it's, you know so obviously sex is a pleasure and um, having children is a happiness but it isn't necessarily a pleasure <laughs> sorry We've all had kids, haven't we? <laughs> in fact, sometimes the, the, the pleasure goes down. And when you have kids, you can there's less time for pleasure. Before you have kids, you were out going to going to fun things, going to going out to shows and going and eating out. Suddenly you've got kids and you're stuck at home with baked beans on toast and you're getting an early night because you're absolutely frazzled in the morning. So the pleasure is going, but you're doing something that is more likely to build long term happiness. And then you, at the very top end, and, and so that, that that's always been a nice, easy one. But what's interesting is in, in the last kind of 10 or 15 years, um, in um, there's been an explosion of the uh, in, in in different realms of psychology, because, again, it's, it's the way technology has opened stuff up and you can actually see now inside the workings of the brain. And you're suddenly finding words righteousness, well-being and joy being spoken about much more regularly. Um, and which is interesting, because you go back to Paul. The kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but it is righteousness. Okay, it's been talked about. Peace, well, shalom is often used as a even in psychologists will say, well, well-being is what you know the ancients used to call shalom. You see, because <laughs> because biblical peace is not just a lack of conflict; it's the sense of well-being in life. It's that my my soul is in that good place. So righteousness, peace, and joy, and and even more recently, I've I've found in secular psychology than using the, the reference to joy, um, and um, uh, which which works really nicely because I always used to say, particularly when I was in church, and I still have said it over the years in the secular context to some of the students I teach on character. So you, we don't have a good word for it, but I often used to say it's kind of righteousness, peace, or joy, those kinds of words, which is this top level of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is. There's something about doing it the right way, and that's deeply satisfying, but it's not exactly satisfying the same thing as my happiness layer. And it's not exactly satisfying the same thing as my physical layer. You know, that one's pleasure. This one's happiness. Because sometimes you don't have to be happy, but you still know the satisfaction of you doing it the right way. Is that, is that making sense? And um, uh, and interestingly, um, in well-being theory, in, in, uh, in modern psychology, um, happiness is is just just one of the dimensions of things that they measure, and in fact, it's not enough. And there are other things that don't you don't have to be happy at at all for. <laughs> they are often to do with meaning and purpose, and those kind of longer term sense of I've done it in the right way. I've been true. I've had integrity to myself. It hasn't made it hasn't been a pleasure to do it. Hasn't even made me happy. But I feel, um, but I'm glad that life has gone the way it has because this bit is held together. And so you're finding those things. So actually, I even found a definition of joy, um, where where it talks about actually joy is is um is where you find but you you find actually the components of it are that you're in a trusting environment, so people that you really trust and they really trust you, and you you're finding purpose in it. And when those two things are coming together, there's something deeper than happiness that they they kind of touch into. So you see, they're writing about. So I just thought it was really interesting that kind of uh, we find it there right the way back in Paul's writing, righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. This kind of trinity of ideas, which um, uh, which are the kind of things that go at this very top level of 
the hierarchy of needs and and um and you get that kind of the flow um upwards and so something when jesus jesus joins the two together blessed are those who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness because theirs is the kingdom of heaven so oh sorry i should have said so it's kind of almost like the kingdom of heaven is in many ways is, is is actually where we in life start to kind of live it in the way that from a secular point of view people talk about it as a self-actualization that you're living out your potential in a way that's natural and makes sense of you and you can feel you feel comfortable with that that's perhaps a, a kind of a qualitative way of understanding the fr the phrase the kingdom of heaven which has always been in one sense much more about god's kingship than if you like a physical location or anything like that it's a it's something about I know his righteousness over me. I know his rightness and that I'm in that flow and so on. And so that, that's kind of a rather long way of just trying to get the tension of what Jesus is introducing here. Um, and it's interesting that it's the last beatitude. It is, if you like, the top of the tree or the top of the pyramid coming to it. Although interesting, he started with the kingdom of heaven when he says, blessed are those of the poor in spirit, because theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> Um, and then he, he moves and finishes with it as well, because in one sense, the this inner journey is about bringing us to that place. It's about delivering us to a place where actually, you know what, doesn't mean to say there weren't things that I would rather have gone differently. It doesn't mean to say that everything has been a pleasure. It doesn't mean to say I've always been happy, but I know my life um, is being worthwhile. It's in him, that kind of, you know, that sense of, of it being together, of shalom, of peace and so on. It seems to be the drive of where where the Sermon on the Mount's taking us to. So, so we kind of actually read the words. He then then turns it around. So he's given us the statement and he says, So blessed are you when people reproach you and persecute you. And they say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake or for my sake. Um, so it's not just because people are being mean to you, you should be happy. It's actually, it's okay when they're doing it because of because of me <laughs> because something about what you're doing for me is leading you into it so rejoice and be really glad he kind of sets it up with a very kind of simple example which actually everybody could under could get for, um you know for um, for great is your reward in heaven for that is how they persecuted the prophets who were before you and i've highlighted the little word reward in red um partly because it's actually a, a it's a very common word in matthew's gospel but we somehow we miss it because we have the, a very kind of, you know, we have a strong theology of the grace of God. Um, so, but because we, we don't want to equate, if you like, salvation as being a reward for anything. Um, but this isn't about salvation. <laughs> um, this, this is about actually something else. It's, it's um, if, you, if you like, there are rewards in heaven, but heaven is not the reward. Um, and I, I'm, I'm kind of highlighting it because it's just one of those things that, um, for those that, that be for theological reasons don't believe that have a real problem ought to have a real problem but they don't they just skip over it because Matthew is always talking about the things that we can do in life that produce rewards that, i.e. there's something about heaven that likes it when we're trying to, to grow into these things and it, it's not that we earn favors <laughs> but just somehow or other there is there is a reward to doing it there is a there is a benefit to it and it may not always be in immediately evident on this plane in this life but actually in a in a heavenly sense is really there so, you know jesus says store up for yourself treasures in heaven and um, because you know where there's no moths, moths moths or rust and so on so why would you store them up and there's some benefit you know it's all of those kinds of things um and so jesus kind of he highlights it with an example which most people get which is you know that thing of we all look back on those who have done incredible things and we all think it wouldn't have been great to be them. But if you stop and think about it, you think oh, it probably, it'd probably been pretty tough to be them. You know, they had to work really hard. Nobody liked them at the time. They had to go against the flow. You know, it'd be much easier to kind of retire down to the, the beach in Cornwall somewhere and kind of uh, and, and, and kind of pontificate with my neighbour about how the world's going to pieces. But but those who kind of have got involved in ways that means that they challenge the status quo, I mean, you know, I, I think um, I think you think back to kind of the Victorian period where the Salvation Army, who are now so respected as a charity all over the world, were absolutely vilified and hated by everybody in power in every Western country that they worked in because they were of, often kind of highlighting how um, how corrupt the, the systems were that looked so good for those who had money, you see. So they were so they went through that kind of thing where all sorts of things would be written about them. But with hindsight, we all think what great people they were, what great reformers. 
they achieve these marvelous things and and so on and so forth and so jesus reminds us of that in one sense remember they that's how they treated them so let's not be try and put it into context try and kind of keep it in uh, keep it in perspective and then he goes on so you are the salt of the earth but if the salt has lost its flavor with what you're going to be salted it's good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men you are the light of the world a city located on the hill can't be hidden and you know um, most of most of Galilee, you could see the new um, the um, the new capital. Well, it was it's no longer the capital when Jesus is in ministry. But while Jesus had been growing up, he he builds the um, what was at the time going to be the new Roman capital in Galilee, um, which was Sepphoris, and it would sat at the top of a hill um, over to the east side, over to the west side of of um, the Sea of Galilee. And from anywhere around Galilee in the night, you could see the city because of the lights and so on. So it was constantly there, dominating kind of sense. You, um, so he, he's kind of probably making a reference to that. You are the light of the world. The city located on the hill can't be hidden. You can see it. You will know it. Neither do you light a lamp and put it under a measuring basket, but on a stand. It shines for all those who are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify the Father who is in heaven. And and I, I kind of highlight a couple of bits. We're going to the, the, we're going to look at the coloured bits in a minute when we go on to the next slide. But um, there are there are ways in which people see what we're doing that's good, and it it, it does give glory to God. And but equally, and it's a kind of this double edged thing. You see, because light does expose. And actually, we, we find that a little bit in the um, in some of the kind of background references that probably Jesus is is picking up and he's referring to. We we'll start with with salt because it's it's kind of it's kind of more interesting. We we all know we all hear it, you know, salt preserves and salt purifies. You know, so you you rub salt into into meat and it doesn't go off and you or whatever. Apparently, in Iceland they have a they have a thing. Sorry, I just just want um. I was sort of reading saying it's something that actually made someone who's eaten a lot of these things actually did throw up. Sorry, to, <laughs> but they where, the, where they have rotten fish that they then treat with so much salt that it kills the bacteria, but the flesh has actually rotted, and it's apparently a very much an acquired taste because <laughs> when people have actually tried it, most people do just kind of instantly throw up. There's something in their instant reaction, <laughs> but, but salt can do that. It can make even the most rotten thing um, edible. You know, get, like clean. <laughs> It may still make you throw up, but it technically is animal. <laughs> um, so we, we know that. But but what I wanted to draw out is there's something about salt um, that, that is covenantal as well. It's just kind of interesting. And you find it, it's salt isn't used in a lot of the sacrifices. If you go back and look at it, they have to be sprinkled with salt and so on. But um, you should know this is two chronicles. Um, and this is actually Abijar, I think, speaking. Um, and he's um, it's at the time where the, um, the northern tribe is, is leaving it's 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 and it's leaving if you like the line of david and he goes and prophesies against them and says should you not know that the god of israel gave the kingdom over to israel uh, the king the kingdom over gave the kingdom of israel it should be the kingdom of israel to david forever even to him and his sons by a covenant of salt so it's this um this idea that that that's something about salt uh, salt is about the kind of um establishing and it, it seems to be kind of an endemic cultural thing we'll see there's been some kind of research done on it um then we, we find a similar thing in leviticus and the, this is just a couple of verses i probably find others as well if i looked harder um for every offering of grain offering you shall season with salt you shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your god to be lacking from the grain see that again there's an assumption so we don't have an explicit thing in scripture um, but but apparently in a very wide sense, um, there, there's been a very ancient kind of understanding that there's something about salt that, that is part of covenant making. Um, and it, that that old, old ancient tradition kind of makes it all the way through to kind of um, uh, in the, um, it, you know, um, in the kind of the that the modern fantasy with all its violent swearing and sex of Game of Thrones. But they have this regular thing where. Where that once you've eaten salt in somebody's house, they can't they can't mistreat you. <laughs> so there's a, they, you know when you arrive, one of the things they notice is if they don't get served bread and salt, you see. So they, and actually that actually seems to be going back into kind of Bedouin cultures is part of the thing that kind of idea of you share bread and also we share salt. There's something about salt which is kind of seen as a precious covenantal type of process. Um, so I just mentioned all that because these are all just kind of cultural norms that the, the, the hearers of Jesus would kind of bring in. So salt is, is about sacrifice. It's about purification. It's about preservation. 
but there's also something covenantal in it. And in that context, he talks about them, it being worked into the ground. You know, we are the salt of the earth. We are almost like part of what is making the earth an acceptable offering, if I can put it that way. Um, and we therefore have to be sprinkled and make to make it acceptable, <laughs> to make it kind of work. Um, it, it's one of those interesting things we we're thinking here about righteousness. But, you know, there's that verse in Psalms, I think it is, which says that righteousness upholds or uplifts a nation. And it, it, it is very much one of the things that economists recognise, which is that actually it costs a lot more when unrighteousness is, is reigning. Um, if you look at, for instance, the the um, diamond markets of the world, and they are almost 100% run by Hasidic Jews. Um, and that is because um, they don't have almost anybody else trying to run a diamond market. Um, it's so prone for, for, for being ripped off and fraud um, that the actual costs um, that you'd be selling your diamonds for are so astronomically higher than, than the Hasidic Jews can do because they are, they 100% they will hand over and they will hand over, they won't even check envelopes of, of diamonds to each other, knowing that if the person who's giving it to me says this is what their quality is and this is what their weight is, they will be, if you see what I mean. Um, and, and, and so righteousness does make things work easier. <laughs> the, the, the flip side, of course, therefore, um, I can't remember why I was saying all that. The, um, why is it? I can't think what I was uh, Yeah, so that's why I was saying, yeah, so so Jesus' kind of comments, therefore, you know, we we are the salt we are the the righteous salt that gets in there actually our presence in things that does make things work better again um a huge amount of the foundation of the economy of the us was based on quaker trading and international trade never would have taken off it hadn't been for the, the the trust that existed within those kind of groups because of the integrity of the way people lived and so on um and so actually whole nations can benefit by by the sprinkling of people who live righteously and know it between each other. Um, I think part of why we discover everything costs more nowadays, Not, I don't mean more to buy, I mean more to do, it costs more to run everything nowadays because you need so many checklists and so many layers of to, 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 to actually take account of the fact that people don't live righteously, that it all just costs 10 times more to run the same program. Um, and it doesn't run as well either. <laughs> um, back in the days when you could trust people, because they were righteous it, it was a lot easier um and so that's that's one of the hard facts of kind of economics and it's kind of written into this the way that jesus talks about it being salt of the earth we're the ones that kind of make it work uplift it that we need to be there we need to be sprinkled in we need to be salty we're part of the covenant we're part of the deal that god has made with with humanity um then we come on to the he then brings in the the concept of light i've gone to, this is done my own little kind of translation of um, Psalm 112, because I think Jesus seems to be drawing on the imagery of Psalm 112 when he takes that and um, let your sh light shine before men. <clears throat> um, I put yeah, uh, yeah, hey, sorry, that's yeah, hey, <laughs> which is which is um, my translation of what um, you would what what it says in most. It says um, you, you'll find that they either opt for praise the Lord, but it doesn't say praise the Lord. <laughs> when it, it doesn't. It actually just says hallelujah. It doesn't say hallelujah, so just praise. But it's kind of it's kind of almost like praise in a whoa way. So, so I thought, seeing as then actually it then does refer to the Lord, but actually in Hebrew it's Yahweh. I thought it might be quite nice if they actually translated as hallelu and then referred to Yahweh. Uh, <laughs> we could say yah hey, <laughs> yah hey, blessed is the man who feel, who fears Yahweh. <laughs> yah hey. You get you get what I'm saying. You, anyway. you, you get why I did it. That, I thought that was a nice yeah. way. <laughs> so yeah, hey, blessed is the man who fears Yahweh. <laughs> he delights greatly in his instructions. So he's so you got that blessed. Blessed are those, the blessed bit. Um, his seed will be mighty in the land. This is very kind of culturally relevant. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house. His righteousness. So blessed is the man. His righteousness endures forever. He shines in the darkness, a light for the upright. See. <laughs> Jesus talks about let your light shine before men see and for the upright he shines in the darkness a light for the upright gracious merciful merciful and righteous so this is kind of this seems to be part of the the context um and um and th there is a very very real kind of sense in which there's this combination of of God's kind of blessing and righteousness that is enduring that produces favor and this is why I'm saying often I think it's because there's something of God's favour when we do get our life into that right place and it's going well 
that it does just provoke people and um, they kind of get frustrated. I remember uh, it seems like a silly thing, but just being on a project that was going really, really stressfully, everybody's getting really wound up and somebody suddenly having a go at me because I didn't swear. <laughs> and um, and it was just one of those funny things because at one level it wasn't too harsh a, a go at me, but neither was it that funny. It really was obviously that it irked him, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I just said, well, I, I said, you know, I said I'm I'm not anti any word. It's all about context. You know, it's actually the truth. You know, I think um, um, bad language is not a particular word. It's using it in the wrong place. You know, <laughs> and you can either degrade something inappropriately because you should be using better words or or whatever. And so. I, but he, he was genuinely seemed frustrated in, in those ways. Um, but something kind of grows. And, and one of the things that, that, that I put there a light, um, the, um, what's the, uh, yeah, it's, um, I think the Hebrew very literally is kind of he is radiating or he's, he's shining, he is shining. Um, so, sorry, he shines, that's the beginning. Yeah, he shines, he's radiating, he's, he's glowing, he's glowing in the dark, a light for the upright. Um, so there is something about that, as I said, that that, that actually it does. Uh, and and the difference between salt is, you see, salt has to get in, and often it's not noticed. You know, it's one of those things that if you can see the salt on your food, you know it's it's too much. <laughs> you know, it, it should be. There's a, there's an element to which righteousness is like salt that just kind of gets worked in, and people don't realise it. They don't realise that we're able to we're able to make this hospital work effectively because there are people who just live righteously. And they get on and they do it quietly and rightly and we just take it for granted and we don't even notice them. But if they weren't there, it would all be grinding to a terrible halt. People would be abusing the system. There wouldn't be any money left, etc. And there's another side to which when we put that light on a lamp, um, it's both attractive, but it also shows up our own dirt, see? <laughs> which is why it creates the two reactions. It, it's both a challenge, it wants to draw us towards it. It can also kind of um, it can also kind of provoke that bad reaction too. <coughs> so it goes on, Matthew. So Jesus then goes on and says, "I don't think I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfil them. So most certainly, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even one smallest letter or one tiny pen stroke shall in any way pass away from the law, until all things are accomplished." And again, I I read these passages. Um, and I think that often we skirt over them because um, they don't quite fit sometimes with the theology that we've kind of built around Jesus. Um, there, there are kind of facts of theology and there are facts of history and the facts of Jesus. And then there's an awful lot of opinion of theology and opinion on Jesus and opinion, whatever. And we have a system in in the modern kind of Protestant church that kind of works, if I can put it that way. But but it often does so by ignoring the difficult bits, if I can <laughs> And um, and in in all seriousness, I have I've met really lovely f Christians, and they have been through River, and there are probably folks in River, so you probably know some of them, um, whose approach to some of these things, like when Jesus says this, is oh well, Jesus, I'm quoting verbatim pretty much, oh well, Jesus was teaching before the death and resurrection, so it doesn't count anymore, you see. <laughs> so the logic is, and then but then I say so so everything Jesus taught was before the, so so therefore none of it's relevant anymore. Does that make sense? And effectively, that's what you do get come down to. And and without wanting to be rude, because we're now streaming and we're going to put this <laughs> recording up live, and I might upset some people. But but in a in a very kind of heavy reform sense, you often find that that there are churches that that spend very little time in the Gospels. They spend all their time in Paul's letters, because actually, if you like, the the grace of God has so covered everything that actually, when Jesus is talking about things like the law, well, we don't need the law, you know. Um, it was a tutor that led us to Christ, but we don't need it anymore. But there's, but Jesus is saying it's still relevant. Now that that doesn't mean you achieve salvation by it, but it it means something, if I can put it that way. So somehow, in a more nuanced way theologically, what we have to do is say, so what is it for? Why is it still relevant? Because Jesus is saying, well, I've I've come not to destroy it away, not to get rid of it, but to fulfil it. <laughs> Um, but actually, in my fulfilling, there are still things that therefore will change in you as a result of that, and probably as a result of what you read in the law, if I can put it that way. Because actually, as Christ is formed in me, some of his fulfilling of it becomes part of me. So it's helpful to know the law and to still set it as a certain levels of standard and, and so on. Does that, that If you get the kind of nuance of what I'm trying to tease out, rather than this kind of like, well, it's also irrelevant because it doesn't really matter because everything's covered in the cross. 
Um, well, that's fine, but that probably is not kind of that, that's missing this layer where Ma Matthew keeps on talking about there are rewards in heaven. <laughs> I, there are some rewards in a spiritual sense to actually getting hold of at the heart of what was in this thing. If I can put it that way, the heart of what was it about. And so uh, while we can't answer that exclusively, I just thought it'd be interesting to see some of the dynamics of how the law is still relevant in one sense. It, which doesn't mean to say we achieve salvation by it, but it still has something that's real about it and that is useful for us to be aware of because actually it was part of Jesus's journey as he fulfills the law and as he is formed in us it's still part of the relevant and so on so um so he he says whoever breaks the least of these commandments and teaches others to do so will be called least in the kingdom of heaven but whoever should do them and teach them should be called great in the kingdom of heaven so I for I tell you that unless your righteousness exceeds the scribes and Pharisees you in no way will enter the kingdom of heaven we'll think about that last verse in a minute um but actually um Again, because I say part of one of the things when I was talking with Anne about this, I thought we'll keep on seeping in some of the bits I do on the psychological layers <laughs> with folks, is actually um, issues of righteousness and morality are growing again as a theme um, in, in psychology. And they're very relevant because what we're discovering is with society that said, hey, you know, it's all free for all. God is dead. We can do what we like. Suddenly discovering that the society falls apart a bit. <laughs> and what are your foundations for morality? And um, and and I thought and what I find is it's quite interesting to see as people who analyse it and think about it, how you can actually apply that to understanding of the Old Testament law and also how it still affects going forwards today. What does it mean if we are free from the law in an absolute sense, but we're still trying to draw from it, which I think is the is the kind of the right way. So um, I put it. This is a guy, Jonathan Haidt. He's Jewish by uh, his uh, um, and and an atheist. But um, he, I, I gave his book to my dad at Christmas. It's called The Righteous Mind. And he's um, and done a huge amount of research, very helpfully, I think. And um, the, the, the model on the corner, he doesn't pull out, but I drew it from reading his book. But he, um, he, he references it. Um, that Actually, there seem to be three sort of dimensions to morality. And if you look right the way across the world, what you find is it's kind of it goes consistently, but but you do find some places don't haven't grown one of the dimensions or so. So, you know, so but actually, if you sum it up, there are sort of three three basic dimensions. There is a kind of a dimension of autonomy. It's about the self and so on. There's a, a dimension about community. And then there's also a kind of one that is about sanctity. And and um, I find that that those three spheres is very helpful because actually you think about the law. So actually, um uh, you know, in terms of sanctity, um, it, it's, um, you know, my body is a temple. So, you know, the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, how do I how, how do I kind of treat it? Um, do I treat it with respect um, or do I, you know, is it just my is my body a playground and I just go and do anything I like with it for whatever reason? And and so you can be Christian or you don't have to be a Christian, but you'll find people who still recognize the place of, if you like, um, uh, although they sorry, that's not so sanctity no let's take another one it would a better one of sanctity is, is you know actually the the place in which we honor say the bible or the place in which we honor the ten commandments and we stick them up on on civic buildings and so on um and and it's kind of the the, the sanctity dimension is what kind of is gives us an, a, an aspiration to go beyond ourselves and and it doesn't have to be christian but every society has to have something that shows them this is the right way and if i'm going this way i'm going down and i'm making things worse if i'm going this way i'm going up and so he would say you know um the the the, the um the um western liberal mindset likes to say that that there should nothing is sacred but they get really offended if you kind of for instance were, were to kind of um, <laughs> trash a character who's an icon in their thinking you know um, so they wouldn't be offended if you if you do a play mocking Jesus, but they would if you kind of um, if you were to mock Martin Luther King or a civil rights activist or Nelson Mandela, you know, that kind of thing. So we all have those things You say it's part of the way in which we we say, actually, we don't go there. It's wrong because actually this is what makes our society aspire for being better. It's that kind of dimension. And, and and seeing those three things, you kind of recognize actually all of those are kind of embedded in the law. There's, um, you know, the, and so auto, and he then highlights and this is where his research is is kind of more unique so that's just something i drew out for it generally we that every single person seems to genetically have six taste buds by which we construct our, our framework of morality um but um there's a there's a phenomena in human development animal development which we refer to as epigenetic 
which is our genes have give us the ability for everything, but some things don't get turned on as we develop. Um, so a, a, a simple example of, epi, of an epigenetic effect <laughs> is that they know in, in social creatures, with which we are some, um, that um, if, um, if, a, if, a, if a child is separated from the mother, um, it doesn't produce um, as many cortisol receptors in its brainstem, which means that for the whole of its life, it will be more, more susceptible to stress. Cortisol is related to stress because those cells grow in those early developmental months and they grow particularly when there's physical contact between the mother and the baby. Is that making sense? And the thing that's really fascinating <laughs> is that in tests with rats, um, if you separate a child f from its, its parents, um, a, a baby rat, um, and you, it's got all the food it needs, so it needs, it's got everything it needs, but it, it produces therefore less cortisol receptors in the brainstem, therefore it's always a more jittery rat. <laughs> and when it has children, even if it nurtures, even if they're children, it's children, if it's a male rat, for instance, even it will genetically pass on a disposition for less cortisol receptors, to grow less cortisol receptors, for three or four generations, which is, sounds uh, incredibly like visiting the sins of the fathers on the third and fourth generation, if you put it that way. In other words, it takes a while, it takes more than one generation to kind of get back to normality because of the the effect. But that, that little bit is what's referred to as epigenetic. So it's, it's, it's genetically in there to either get turned on or not get turned on. And he makes the case that these kind of, if you like, these taste buds in us, um, some of them don't get turned on by certain cultures, if I can put it that way. <laughs> And, and he, he highlights that, that, the, that the liberal West is what he refers to as weird. Western educated, I can't remember what the I is, um, radical democracies. Um, and he said they are weird and that, and because actually that, that um, there's a big chunk of these that they don't turn on, just don't turn on in the West. Which is interesting because it kind of explains a little bit why the morality of the generations of the West is slipping away from what you see as a biblical morality, which is often much more in step with the rest of the world which actually he, he highlights that it, it's much more it seems that these things are not getting turned on in the West. <laughs> um, and so he, he, he mentions, for instance, so he highlights that everybody, every single person seems to have a dimension that measures care or harm. So we all know um, we shouldn't do, we, and, and typified by Jesus is, you know, treat others the way you'd want to be treated, like you treat them with care rather than harm. So we we all have a we all kind of if you like recognize it notice it taste it we taste when when that that thing is moving along and almost everybody in the world also recognizes the the fairness to cheating seems to be again part of, seems to be hardwired into the way we're made everybody seems to have that so um, so and so didn't get doesn't have the same opportunities that the other person ha doesn't have that so that's again it's very much part of if you like the morality of Western democracy. Those two things, oops, sorry, is, um, th those two kind of taste buds or dimensions or whatever the things that he measures are, are kind of common. And then there's one which some people in the West have and others don't, which is be highly wired towards liberty and oppression. Um, you know, so I I know because I've I chat through political things with my kids that my kids are not as sensitive. I I, I put a strong I've, I've I have a strong kind of thing on on are we actually free am I free to manage myself or, or can I not? And, you know, there are lots of Christians that have grown up in countries where they can't and therefore they've learned to live without it and they don't see it as such an important thing. <laughs> um, so it's something that may get turned on, may not. <clears throat> but also we have one for loyalty and betrayal. And you see that, that very clearly, you see, is about building community. You can't build communities if you don't have sensitivity to loyalty and betrayal. And, um, and people do better when they're in communities and when they're not. So it's a very useful thing but where he says they all have their very strong uses. All of these taste buds, if when they're working, do something positive, if I put it that way. So the first two are very much can, just about me and my, this is how I treat other people. I treat them fairly. I don't, and I don't want to be myself. So it's me as an individual. As we move on to things like now loyalty and betrayal, we're much more in the domain of, of community. Um, the reason why loyalty is good is because um, it helps us be it helps us do things together. And people who trash loyalty, we need to be suspicious of because actually if everybody did that, we wouldn't be able to achieve as much as we do together. Is that making sense? Um, and things like authority, which honor the uh, honor your father and mother, authority subversion again helps community hold together. 
but then you kind of move on then to the kind of if you like the sanctity degradation is is actually what are the icons that that the that multiple communities can gather around and that that's very much so you know burning the flag and um, some people don't care about it see because <laughs> they're weird because they've they're part of the ones who aren't affected by that others it may not be you or me but they would say but that's one of the things that holds multiple communities in our country together does that make sense it's something sacred it's part of the shared sense of what we hold dear and we hold value to is that making so so he puts all those things together and i just i, I found them it's very helpful i found a very helpful little kind of dimension to one to see the three different ways and three to, to and he notices he said so although in the west actually because i sorry i'll show you his little graph here <laughs> Um, he's measured that they've got a website they've done thousands and thousands of these surveys and they've looked at politics so and he was a speechwriter for obama he's a democrat and he says basically he's he's had his views changed by his research and he he because he believes that um uh he, that conservatives will keep on winning through when when the when the if you like the democrats think they shouldn't because they actually tend to be people who have all of their emotional taste buds turned on if that makes sense um sorry this is it can sound very provocative to anyone who's listening here because and, and i'm, I'm re reporting it to someone who's done the research who sits on the other end so saying this is who i am this is just to recognize this but, but because i don't notice these things but other people do but the, the, but actually they share a lot in common with the majority if i can put it that way so he found that, that on the whole you know, see liberals are very high the big thing is on care versus harm then the next thing is they focus on is fairness and cheating and third, they often have a line of liberty oppression, but that's the minor. But then they don't really touch the other things at all. That's classical kind of liberal thinking, you know. So, so what in the UK now we refer to as being progressive, it can be right or left, but you know that kind of sort of approach. And the the full libertarians who are kind of let you do absolutely anything, they're not so bothered by care or harm. It's just fairness, and am I free to do it? You know. <laughs> So I can't see a problem with having sex with my sister because it doesn't hurt anybody. And who are you to tell me? Do you, do you get the? It doesn't. You know, it doesn't hurt anyone if she agrees. It's consensual. That kind of thing. So that that's kind of classic libertarianism. Sorry, I, I chose a sexual example, which is unfair because there are non-sexual ways of of typifying. But you know, the, the sort of that approach. Um, conservatives often kind of care in some way or other about all of them but interestingly they often care a smaller amount about all of them you see whereas on the progressive side they care an awful lot about just a couple of things is the way he, he kind of saw it and it's very helpful when you understand the kind of clashes of, of what's going on but the thing that was very interesting in his research is he said in actual fact what you find is that on the liberal side when you really delve down you still have them all there but they've all been absorbed so that they are only understood in terms of care or harm so, for instance, he said you could take a classic liberal who would laugh at, uh, at Jewish Jewish kind of food laws, but they would never buy non-organic and they would be carefully checking the sources of all their foods. They said, actually, it's just a, it's become a, a way of adding a care dimension to, a, to, to actually an instinct that we have in us, which is that I ought to care about what goes into my body, <laughs> which is, you know, <laughs> so Jewish person might not eat shellfish. And, and they certainly won't eat eggs that don't say free range on them, you know. So, <laughs> so he, it's just, and the, the um, why am I saying that? Is, is the reason I, I want to get it across is because there is something in humanity that needs to be righteous. Um, and, and, and we would, a lot of people, in reality, we might try and kill it in ourselves. We don't want to hunger and thirst for it. But really, it's healthy for us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. But it can get distorted, it can get misshaped, it can get misdriven. Is why political correctness is such a strong power. Is it's it's people desperate to live right, because something in them knows that they ought to live righteously. But so they're trying to come up with a framework for it and put labels on it, and they feel really good. And and woe betide you if you challenge one of the things that they live right to, which you don't think is important, <laughs> if I can put it that way. Which is why I think that the law is still relevant. <laughs> Because it, while it may not help us in our salvation, to understand what God allowed us, and some of what he gives, I think, when he gave it, was very specifically about helping, um, which is one of the things that comes out of research on the conservative side, is that actually I, um, very often there, there are things that you choose to do, which aren't in themselves, you have to do them, but then you sacralize them because that's what bonds you together. So in other words, if we all choose 
to, to wear red, you know, because we all support Manchester United. <laughs> okay, we could have chosen any colour. In fact, the marketeers want to change the colour every year, so I buy a new shirt. But we all choose to wear red. We could have chosen blue, we could have chosen white, but we've done this. And now it's important that everybody turns up wearing red, if I can put it that way. And so actually it was important that 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 actually for for the for the for the Jewish um, nation to hold together through the history that God was going to put them through when they're at the hub and the crossroads of the world, getting spread out into empire after empire. Being if they, the the fact that they have held together for for four millennia <laughs> is a, is an absolute miracle, <laughs> and a huge chunk of that is because they have such a strong cultural identity which they honour. Does that make sense? So you know you can say is God really anti-selfish? Probably not. <laughs> But, but actually the fact that they, it, these kind of awkward things meant that they ate together and they, they kind of stuck together, they actually it helped them to achieve what they needed to be as custodians and guardians of the oracles of, of the Lord. I mean, there are other things though, which are kind of much more generic, you know, in terms of, you know, thou shall not murder and so on. That's, uh, that's pretty good for pretty much everybody. That's not, that doesn't sit so much in the what holds the communities of communities together. It's just it, it sits in the care harm kind of dimension is that making sense <laughs> so it's it's kind of a universal thing whereas you get that kind of spectrum so i just thought it'd be interesting to kind of put those those thoughts up there and and because this is part of the final flow of the of the sermon on the mount in one sense is is the words of jesus which we receive like we received the old testament the, the the ten words the decalogue the ten commandments but they weren't really commandments they were words or promises which is we receive them in the right way and we let them get into us and then we let them challenge the inner life they will be producing a style of righteousness in us so it's not just we get freedom and we're saved but actually it will produce the right way of living um, and we often change our moral choices on things the more longer we walk with jesus because over time we start to change our perspective on things he kind of gradually changes us. it produces something in us um, and so it's useful to have a kind of a rough feel of where we like to be heading <laughs> um, so the law is always going to be going to be relevant so nearly done so um jesus can fulfills and he completes the law by internalizing it he doesn't destroy it so the bad news of course is the way it finishes unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the pharisees you will not enter the kingdom of heaven so that's bad news <laughs> but remember the kingdom of heaven is not salvation it's not going to heaven in fact you know it's um it's it's is a good judgment in the resurrection it's not going to heaven that we're aiming for the, the kingdom of heaven is actually about that as we saw it's much more of that kind of actualization of god's kingship in our lives um that actually the, the, the kind of right way of living is is goes beyond where the pharisee got to in jesus's day let me put it that way that's very helpful, that's very helpful. yeah yeah, sure. yeah. And and uh, and then you know so that's the bad news unless your righteousness surpasses. But the good news is blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness because they will be satisfied, which is the middle beatitude we'll cover later in the <laughs> later in the series. Which is actually there's something in us as we go through this process as we open ourselves to the Lord and that hum humility that He He produces something in us that drives us or draws us or or woos us towards the right kind of uh, righteousness that He will satisfy and we will accomplish and succeed in. So I think well, I can't. What's the time there? Although it's not too bad. It's not too late. <laughs> we did it all in one long marathon session, and I sat here and talked at you. Uh, <laughs> but I think that's yeah the end. The end. Does anyone want to ask anything or say anything or? Uh, yeah. I think it's much more important to be the beginning of building, yeah. of developing a proper balance and understanding of what we really know. Most of us know in our yeah. You know, we just know it because we've been brought up with this. Yeah. But do we understand it? And I think that for me is quite interesting. You've said and pointed out so many things that just never yeah. uh, occurred to me. You know, we got to that uh, the the, uh, the Jewish gentleman's uh, yeah. view of how people are wired. As yeah. Well, not. Uh, I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Because it does it does highlight quite easily a lot of what we're seeing in our present generation. Yeah, in yeah, it does. Yeah, the Western world. Yeah, no, I think that's right. Yeah, no, it does. That, that's why I found him quite helpful. Which is a, um, you know, and it it, it it's um, it, even in what he's presenting, he's presenting it as a kind of an an aid to understanding as opposed to an absolute 
kind of truce. He he suspects that the, it comes down to basic wiring that therefore we have these things, you know, that to do with the structures of the brain. But it's not. Um, but the the fact that we can kind of seem to suppress them or develop them, he says that's that's true of a lot of functions in in our brains. Doesn't mean they're not natural if they appear. It just means that we've had a society that's not needed, doesn't think it needs them, so so it's it doesn't produce them. But so you 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 say that his book explains his thinking on those things, but that's for a man who is obviously uh, quite clever. Yeah. You wonder where he goes next with it. Yeah, well, I I, th I find it a lot with a lot of a lot of modern psychology is is actually now very helpful to. A Christian agenda, <laughs> um, but it's not been got there by that route. Um, but I just, you know, it's um, it's it's be, it's come yeah. about by research with people, yeah. and yeah. you know, I, I put up the thing on well-being. You know, um, I could have put up a picture of, of the guy who's kind of developed well-being theory, and you could have put up the things, and how many how many things in that are, are based on on Christian ideas or Judeo-Christian ideas, if you put it that way. Yes. All Christian ideas can be expressed. Yeah, through them, through, through them, them, yeah. And so, you know, chicken or egg. You know, yeah, that's right. In, in some people, it will be, won't it? No, and the way I said I put it with folks is that a lot of these things work not because we're Christian, but because we're human. <laughs> so we 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 believe them because we have them th through a, a revelationary revelationary process yeah. and a and a worship process and so on. So we we have them that way, but they work not because we we do that because we're Christian, but because we're human. <laughs> yeah. And there's a way God has wired us. He's, the way he's made us is to yeah. be that way, yeah. 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 Right. So, there is a lot in all of that. There is. But uh, as I say, that's why I think it's more like the beginning and the end, really. Yeah. <coughs> so, Anne, what was it you were saying at the end? Sorry, you said something that was helpful at the end. Yeah, so, that, so um, interesting. That thing, um, just, yeah, right at the very end, where we had the bad news and the good news. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but just that if you can't if you can't be more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees, then you can't enter into heaven. But it's the other way around. Yeah. But actually, it's because you need. I don't know. You need. Is that need, that's part of the? Yeah. You, you need. You need. Doing it the right way is the part yeah. of the process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I find and it, and yeah and and you so often even though we know that the kingdom of heaven isn't heaven. Yeah. Then. It just sounds so negative to non-Christians. Yeah, it does. But, but when you put it like that, it's not. Yeah, so much at all. And, and it's interesting because you know, um, it's we we get the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel, and Matthew never writes the Kingdom of God; he writes the Kingdom of Heaven, and that's almost certainly to do with the with the Jewish sensitivity that some rabbis. It, it it wasn't that universally they wouldn't say God, but 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 some were sensitive to it, and so Heaven was often used as a substitute. So. Um, almost certainly, it, you know, when, when you read, often we read in Mark or in Luke, we hear Jesus talking about the kingdom of God. It seems that when Matthew has been kind of putting the authorized together, which is is being circulated in Jerusalem primarily, <laughs> um, he's been sensitive to all of his readers by changing kingdom of God to kingdom of heaven, which is a standard kind of equivalent saying without causing offence. Um, Mark, who's we're told it was wrote his gospel for the Romans. <laughs> up in Rome when he's there with Peter and probably based on Matthews but it's for them that they don't they're not sensitive like that so he just has the kingdom of God that makes more sense <laughs> Luke who's writing for Paul who's who's moving in his missionary journeys he can write the same because it's it's less of a sensitive issue but uh, mm. Cause I, I think I got very fixed on the idea because it was very re revolutionary for me when I learned about it back in the I don't know, eight, early 80s about the kingdom of heaven, or kingdom of God, being the reign of God in us. Yeah. And I don't, because I've often thought of it as something outside. That it's something that that comes onto the world out yeah. there, the rule of God, which is just where God reigns, and not thought of it so much as. The, and the no, it's not you're not going to the kingdom of heaven. No, no, it's not that. Yeah. I'm not thinking about. It's so much internal. It, yeah, it's the internal thing. Yeah. yeah. The kingdom of God is within you. Is that that uh, that's the kind of clinching statement by Jesus, really, isn't it? <laughs> is uh, you know, I think if you weigh up everything else, you kind of got this tension of is it internal, is it external? And then Jesus has that kind of very clear, it's in you. <laughs> it has impact out there, and it there are things out there you'll see that you can say that reflects it. But fundamentally, it's something that you you feel in you, you get it in you. Good. Well.
that was <laughs> thank you for coming and being here yeah. and i will uh, stop streaming and stop recording now oh no it stopped stopped okay oh no it stopped